Now, when we do the word telescope, we often think of either the small portable ones or the observatories on top of mountains. But telescopes come in all shapes and sizes. And one of the most successful ways of doing observational cosmology, looking at the history of the universe as a whole, is by launching uh, telescopes on balloons high up in the atmosphere in the Arctic and Antarctic. And our speaker tonight, uh, Juan Diego Soler, is, uh, is greatly involved in that uh, endeavor. Juan has worked in physics labs in both North and South America, as well as Europe, and he's currently finishing up his PhD with the, uh, the Balloon Astrophysics Group here at U of T. Uh, he's also a photographer and a writer, and a couple of his articles about his adventures have, uh, have uh, graced the pages of South American newspapers. And tonight, he's going to be talking about his adventures in Antarctica, and how he explained to his mother why astronomers want to fly a telescope over one of the coldest, most desolate places in the world. Juan, everyone. Thanks, Charles. Can everybody hear me back there? Good? Good, everybody there? OK, so let's start. So the beginning of the talk is a little bit complicated, because of course I was going to do the usual dog and pony show about my adventures in Antarctica. But there was a major event in the, the last few weeks that kind of changed the idea that I had. And it all starts in the cover of the New York Times <coughs> on March the 21st. And it's featuring this image. And it calls it the cosmos back in the day. And it wasn't the only newspaper that did that. He's the International Herald Tribune and has the same image and calls it the infant universe. He's uh, not the only one. The Financial Times call it the universe, but not as we know it. Uh, OK, uh, this one's more complicated. Is Ger there a German in the audience? Uh, this must be good. This is all better, so I guess it's good, it's a German newspaper. And then this is the most interesting one of those, because it calls it also the universe 13.8 billion years ago, but it has a different image. So what I'm going to do tonight is try to explain you what is that? Why do we care about uh, this image that appears in the front page of the main newspapers in the world? And why do we end up in Antarctica if we begin with the old universe. So uh, here we start. So I have renamed the talk. We're not looking for the stars in the place where the sun is always up, but we're looking for the infant universe. And hopefully everything is better. So the story begins in the same place when I, where I got my first job as a physicist. Is any, no, anybody recognizes this building? I can give you a hint. It's the building where they invented the bazooka. <laughs> Any bazooka lovers? No. Well, this is the Corcoran Hall in George Washington University. And I got my first job there uh, 10 years ago. And my office was down here. Uh, of course, there was a construction site in the front, so I couldn't see anything. But the important office in this story is this office up here. That office belonged to a certain George Camel. George Camel was a very famous and well-known a uh, physicist and, well, science divulgator. He has lots of books uh, of, in physics and astrophysics, uh, particularly his biography of, of uh, the physics is very well known. And uh, back in the 50s, this guy started with a simple question, and it's where the elements that conform our universe come from? Where the helium, where the hydrogen, where all the elements that conform our universe are coming from? And then he wrote this paper, uh, with uh, his grad student, Ralph Alfer, and then he included his German colleague, Hans Bethe. Bethe didn't do anything on the paper, but it sounds amazing, Alpha, Bethe, and Gamma. So it sounds like <laughs> Alpha, Bethe, and Gamma. So he, they decided to just include it in the paper. In this paper, he said, uh, the following. So in the image of the universe that we had in, back in the 50s, there were three main ingredients. First. The universe was expanding. All the points in the universe are uh, going far apart from each other, and that was discovered by Hubble early in the 20th century. Also, we had a good theory that could describe the mathematics of the universe, and that was Einstein's general theory of relativity. So we had a mathematical tool, and we had an idea that if the universe is expanding, at some point it must have been compressed in a single point in this uh, singularity from which all the things that we see 
come from. And that idea uh, was proposed by George Lemaitre, a Catholic priest in Belgium. So this is the image of the universe that there was in, uh, in the 50s. So Gamow, a nuclear physicist, uh, well, decided to integrate the idea that the universe was expanding, that it came from a single uh, point before, a singularity, uh, that we call Big Bang, and that was the name that Lemaitre gave it. Uh, and he decided to combine that with the knowledge that we have of nuclear physics. So, in the 50s, nuclear physics was big. Actually, uh, let me see. I got a quote here from a guy called Yuri Smirnov, who is the co-author of the Russian H-bomb. So, uh, Smirnov writes, there's a deep analogy between physical processes we take inside nuclear bombs and stars. That's why whenever somebody came to Sarov, the Russian nuclear center, we told them that we just do, we were doing research in astrophysics. <laughs> so the idea is this one. If you have a condition in which there's enough temperature or pressure, he, uh, hydrogen can turn into heavier elements. And the simplest of those reactions turns hydrogen into deuteron, the heavy uh, relative of the, of, the of the hydrogen, and out of the reaction comes helium. And after that, different sequences produce all the elements that we see. Uh, the main outcome of that was a, particularly quantity, a particular quantity of helium, which is very hard to measure in the sky. But something else that was very easy to measure, at least that's what uh, Gamow predicted, was light. If there was a singularity in the past, and that singularity after the expansion of the universe produced the conditions such that nuclear f fusion was happening, then there must be an afterlight, a glow that is coming from all around the universe that must be detectable. So let me go further on that. So if we go back in the history of the universe, back when the universe was so small and compact that the temperature was high enough to produce nuclear fusion reactions, we would have this state in which hydrogen atoms, or just protons, were joining together and were producing the helium that we see today. If this was produced in the, in the universe, it should be homogeneous and we should see it all around us, as opposed to stars. If this phenomenon was happening only in the stars, we should see certain quantities of helium around stars and some other quantities of helium all around us. So the idea is going back in time, uh, that light that is coming from, uh, from the moment where the, he where the helium was produced must be still traveling around the universe. And that should be measurable. So that was uh, George Gamow's theory. So the universe would look like this. If you see with the right pair of glasses, there was an afterglow that was covering the whole universe. And that, uh, that afterglow is isotropic and homogeneous. So isotropic and homogeneous are words that astrophysicists love. <laughs> so do you know what it means, actually? So homogeneous means that it's the same here, as here, as here, as here, as here. Homogeneous, that's easy. The difficult one is isotropic. And that took me a while in my first years of physics. And it's, it doesn't matter the direction in which you go. Uh, you see the same. That means isotropic. So the universe, if it was isotropic and homogeneous, and there was this thing that was producing all the helium that we see now, then we should see light coming from all the directions. Kind of if we had s the surface of a star all around us. So, well, that was a theory. And people who take theory seriously started to look for these things. So, uh, in the Princeton Gravity Group, uh, the team led by Robert Dickey, they started building an antenna that was supposed to measure this afterglow. The team was composed of uh, uh, Peter Roll and David Wigginson, and the exact kind of radiation that was coming from us uh, out of this production of, uh, of, the, uh, of, of the lighter element was studied by Jim Peebles. Jim Peebles is one of those figures that I always wanted to meet. The first knowledge in cosmology that I had came from uh, the book written by Jim Peebles in the 70s. So when I met him uh, a couple of years ago when he was visiting uh, the Canadian Institute of Theoretical Astrophysics, which is just upstairs, uh, I wanted to get to talk to him. And it was really hard. When you meet one of these idols, you don't think there's anything smart that you can talk about with him. So 
I met him several times again and again, but then uh, early this year when we went to Princeton for the integration of one of our experiments, I met Jim Peebles again, and again I didn't have anything too smart to say and I couldn't establish a conversation, uh, but then we were invited to a pork roast. So we were there, all of us in the pork roast, and uh, I'm South American, and whenever there's a pork roast, there's something that you have to follow and it's the head because the cheek of the pork has the most tender meat ever. <laughs> and if you haven't tried, do it. <laughs> so everybody's very uh, disturbed by having the whole animal there, and when it's decapitated, I immediately start following the head of the pork <laughs> to the kitchen. <laughs> so when there, nobody was around, they wanted to feed the ears of the pork to the dog, so they were putting that in the kitchen while everybody was eating the rest of the pork. And I saw that there was nobody else in the kitchen, and I sneak in, and I was ready to eat my chick, and then I met Jim Peebles directly in front of me. <laughs> and he tells me, my boy, you know exactly what you're doing. <laughs> so coming back to this, these guys in Princeton were looking for light that was coming from the universe. But what kind of light? And that's what I'm going to tell you now. So light. The light that we see every day is just a little portion of the family that composes all the electromagnetic radiation that we know as light. So all the colors that we know correspond to different frequencies of that light. That doesn't uh, mean that there's not more that have less or more energy. So we're going to start with some familiar ones that we know and then I'll, I'll talk about some of the more exotics. So has anybody had an x-ray before? Everybody has had an x-ray? The x-rays are the relatives of the, of the visible light which have more energy and because they have more energy they can permeate matter so when you go and get your x-ray done what you get is an image of the places where the x-rays can't cross so you see your bones and it's very energetic radiation that's why you shouldn't have x-rays every day uh, and it has a relative which are the gamma rays which are even more powerful and has anybody had a gammagraphy? Those are not as popular and are very dangerous, <laughs> <laughs> but they use them nevertheless. And the gamma rays are used for medical imaging and also for treating cancer. So all of these are types of light which have more energy than the light that we see with our eyes. Then, has anybody heard about the ultraviolet? Anybody has been to uh, some Cuban vacation in the middle of the Canadian winter? The ultraviolet is the, is the closest relative to the purple. The purple light that we see is uh, the color that has a more energy in the visual spectrum and it's stopped by the Earth's atmosphere in the ozone layer. It's, uh, it's where most of the energy of the sun is coming. Uh, it's uh, the chunk of energy that uh, is radiated the most by the sun. And then there's the visual that we all know the colors and then there is the infrared. So the infrared is a kind of light in which objects that have our temperature are radiating. But I'll get into that uh, a little bit more. Then there's the microwaves. Everybody has heard about the microwaves. Then there's the radio waves and then the, the broadcasting bands. Those antennas that look like drums that are around the CN Tower, those are radio antennas. So all of these phenomena correspond exactly to the same physical behavior and it's light. X-rays, gamma rays, visible light. We just can't see in all the other bands, but we see the visible. But there's animals that can see beyond the visible. So we humans, we can see three colors. We see blue, green, and red. And all the colors that we see are combinations of those, of those three. But there's animals in nature that can see up to 11 colors. So uh, there's this little animal, which is the mantis shrimp, that can see 11 different colors between the blue and uh, between the purple and the red. So this animal can see colors and tones in between the blue and in between the green that we can't see and we can't distinguish. And this is just an example of how our vision of the world is just limited by the kind of frequencies that we can perceive. So the first astronomer to wonder about this kind of, uh, of radiation that we can't see was Sir William Herschel. And he did a very strange experiment. He put a prism uh, in front of the light that was coming from the sun. And if you have this, done this experiment or you have seen the surface of a bubble, you know that there's a rainbow that is being formed. And you can see the colors of the rainbow. You see, from red to purple. So William Herschel put thermometers in each one of those colors. And then he noticed 
that the thermometer that was in the purple was uh, recording a temperature which was higher than the thermometer that was in the red. Uh, he was very curious and I guess he did have lots of time. Uh, <laughs> he decided to put thermometers beyond the red. And he was still recording uh, temperatures. He was registering temperatures in those thermometers. And that was the beginning of the infrared radiation. That was the first record of astronomical infrared radiation that we have. That's why the infrared telescope Herschel has his name. Then another very curious scientist was uh, Mr. Fraunhofer. So Mr. Fraunhofer doesn't even, uh, didn't only uh, went beyond the infrared, but he also quantified how much energy was in each one of the colors. And he made this little curve over here. So he saw that there was less red than there was yellow in the sunlight. This is a map of the sunlight. And then see, he discovered these little bands that are down here. Fraunhofer is the father of the modern astrophysics because he was the first one to take a little vial with helium and put it in front of a lamp and then uh, observe the sun and compare the lines and the kind of light that was coming from that. So he was the first one to identify that the light that we receive from the sun is actually matching the light that you can see uh, in, in the lab from elements like helium and hydrogen and all the others that we know. But the important part was that he measured this little curve. And that was very interesting. So interesting that it's one of the main concepts of modern physics and it's what physicists call a black body. So if you meet an astrophysicist in a cocktail and he talks about black body, don't feel intimidated. What the astrophysicist is trying to say by a black body means that the curve, so the amount of colors uh, that a body is emitting, depends on its temperature. And depending on that temperature, the curve is going to be different. So if you're very, very hot, you, you're going to emit more in the purples and actually beyond the purples uh, in the ultraviolet. And if you're colder, you're going to emit more in the infrared. This was very important. It was really hard to explain. So hard to explain that the first guy who explained that, Max Planck, won the Nobel Prize for explaining that. And that's why he became the father of the modern quantum theory. That's also why the satellite is called Planck, the satellite that we're talking about today. And here's the satellite. So, do you all understand this? Because now, there's a quiz. <laughs> so, if you guys are all healthy, you must be around 37 degrees Celsius or uh, 310 degrees Kelvin. If I take a picture of you with the lights off, I can see you all glowing in the infrared. Actually, these are pictures taken by NASA of people uh, and a cat. <laughs> And you can see that they are glowing, even with the, with the lights off. But here comes the interesting point. This is molten lava. Given that color and the scale that I made on the right, at what temperature is that lava? In the red, so it must be around 1,000 Kelvin. So if you drop your keys in molten lava, forget about it. They're gone. Don't melt. Something more familiar to us on molten lava is the filament of a light bulb. So if you see that the light from that light bulb uh, falls around here, it's right. The filament of the light bulb is around 6,000 degrees Kelvin, or 6,275 degrees Celsius. And the stars, the stars come in every single color, and that ha that's how astrophysicists can determine what is the temperature in each one of the stars. So if you see a blue star, it means that it's very, very hot. And if you see a red star, it means that it's cooler. And it's still very hot, but it's cooler than a blue star. Uh, sure. Are they, is it possible that the star is so hot? Is, is, it, is it a purple star? It's a purple star? Yeah. Yeah. There's the stars that are, we call them blue, but actually most of the radiation comes around the purple, and even beyond the purple in the, in the ultraviolet. So yeah, there's something like a purple star. I don't know why it doesn't catch the name, but people call it blue stars. Okay, and here's a trick question. Why the fire that we have, the flame that we have coming from the stove is not at 8,000 Kelvin? Why we are not boiling uh, nuclear helium in our, in, our, <laughs> in our kitchens? That is because the phenomenon is different. The, what is causing the light 
is uh, the molecules and the elements that are inside of the flame. So this is molecular emission or uh, emission given the structure of the element that is that is emitting. And that is different to thermal emission. So when the when the light is coming from the mere temperature of the object, you have this very nice pattern, and that nice pattern corresponds to a particular temperature. If the temperature comes from a particular uh, electronic organization of that element, that's an imprint of whatever is there, and uh, the color doesn't correspond necessarily to the temperature of the object. So coming back to Mr. Peebles, he predicted that the temperature uh, of this microwave radiation, oh, I did the wrong, now I spoiled the story because I told you guys that it's microwave, because he predicted that the temperature would be around 3 or 5 degree Kelvin, that's like minus 270 degrees Celsius, and that corresponds to glowing in the microwave. Okay, so far so good, let's see what time is it. So the history changed with the first TV broadcasting. Uh, People were trying to send signals using the microwave from the United States to Europe. And for that, they used these humongous antennas. And they launched the first satellite called the Telstar. And this satellite was, uh, was uh, allowing to uh, send signals from New Haven to uh, the port of Calais in France. So it was in fashion to try to see how much of the microwaves can be transmitted through the atmosphere. Because, well, it was important for com communications. What if you didn't want to send a signal to France, but you wanted to send it to Moscow? You will have more atmosphere. So it was very important uh, for people back in the days to measure how much microwaves can you transmit. And this team of guys, Arno Penskins and Robert Wilson, were measuring the transmission of microwaves in the atmosphere. And the motivation was uh, just measuring uh, how much microwaves can we send as a, as a function of the angle in the sky. And it turns out they found light that didn't depend on the elevation in the sky, which was constant, and it was around 3.5 Kelvin. And they reported this, and in the beginning they didn't believe it, and they discovered that there was a dielectric material, which in reality was pigeon poo inside of the antenna, <laughs> and they thought that was the source of this very weird background. They cleaned it up. They put it back together, and the signal was still there. And that's what we know now as the cosmic microwave radiation. This is the first measurement of the cosmic microwave radiation. And of course, they acknowledged the work of uh, Dickey, Peebles, Roll, and Wilkinson in recognizing that this is the echo of the Big Bang. This is the event where the hydrogen and the helium and all the elements that we know were formed. Now there's an intermission. <laughs> and now I'll explain you why there's an intermission. It was a real intermission. Since the 65 until the early 90s, there was no real measurement that could really constrain the temperature of the CMB. That CMB is how they call the cosmic microwave radiation. And there's a reason for that. The atmosphere of the Earth protects us from many kinds of light, including the X-rays and the gamma rays. That's why when you go out into the street, you're not being radiated constantly by X-rays or gamma rays. Also, it doesn't allow some of the infrared to come in, but also particularly the wavelength which corresponds to a black body at 3 degree Kelvin, which is our cosmic microwave background, doesn't make it to the ground. So they needed to fly balloons and rockets and satellites to measure that, <coughs> that, after, that afterglow. And it wasn't until 1992 that for the first time we could measure it over the whole sky. So this is how all of the universe looks. If you Stand in a point in the universe and you look all around with microwave glasses, this is what you would see. And the difference between the blues and the yellows in this map are one in a hundred thousand. So this is extremely, extremely homogeneous. And actually is the most precise black body naturally occurring that has ever been measured. This is very, very, very particular. It was, uh, it was a huge result. And of course it created a whole branch of uh, of studies of our universe, because if we knew it was homogeneous, every single perturbation that we would see, we could use to constrain the geometry of the universe. And that's what Boomerang did, flying from Antarctica. They measure, uh, it turns out that those spots that you see, if you measure them with enough precision, you can actually know the geometry of the universe. If it's open, it's closed, if it's flat. 
and they determine, and then in 2001, WMAP determined even more that the universe is flat and that this afterglow comes from 400,000 years after the Big Bang. So let's go back to Planck, which is the origin of all of, of, all of our story. Planck was launched to measure the sky and measure the cosmic microwave radiation with a precision never achieved before. And in order to do so, he was flown uh, 1.5 million kilometers from the Earth to this point that is called L2, the Lagrangian point 2. And he was there to scan all of the sky twice per year. So Planck there in the L2, which is shadowed from the light of the sun, so the L2 is right uh, behind the Earth, so it's, been sh uh, it's shadowing direct uh, radiation from the sun, is mapping the sky in the microwaves and producing the image that you saw in the cover of the newspapers. So this is the way you produce that flattened map that, uh, that we saw before. So that's how Planck is scanning the sky. And you know what is this white band over here? That's the Milky Way. That's our galaxy. That's something that we have to remove in order to see what is behind it. So that's our map. So remember the cover of the French newspaper? This is the image that they feature. But actually, what the young universe is, is behind it. So this is the Milky Way. And this is how the Milky Way glows in the microwave. So that's the Milky Way. And this is uh, the map that Planck generated. So Planck, for the first time, mapped the sky in nine frequencies around the microwave to get the Milky Way out of the way. Milky Way out of the way, that's a good one. Um, and observe the cosmic microwave background with uh, more precision than ever was measured before. And in between, it characterized really well our, our galaxy. So this is a map of the Milky Way in uh, carbon monoxide. So this is a subproduct which is extremely important for the people that are worried about star formation and about the processes which produce the uh, structure that we see in our galaxy. So there it is. This is the map of the cosmic microwave background, which corresponds to this. This is WMAP, so this has five times more resolution than WMAP. And it has the extraction of all the foregrounds produced by the galaxy has been improved greatly. So let's make a mini summary. So what we learned from uh, Kobe and uh, the Big Bang Theory and uh, the cosmic microwave radiation is that the universe is homogeneous, is isotropic, and it has a temperature which corresponds to a black body at 2.72 uh, degrees Kelvin. Later, we learn that the universe is flat because of the pattern of these little spots that we see on the sky. And then you will ask me, and that, what did we learn from Planck? What is the big thing? Actually, the big thing that we learned from Planck is that the universe is vanilla. <laughs> the universe is a very simple, uh, is very simple compared to our models. So with, uh, with uh, Planck, we dismiss many exotic theories about how our universe uh, behaves, about wrinkles in the space or uh, being produced by events that are correlated to each other. Actually, that's the first thing that we learned from Planck. So what is coming up? What is coming up is, of course, we have these patches, but we also can measure which is the preferred orientation of the light that is coming towards us. And that is called polarization. So the plane in which the light that is coming towards us stores information about a very particular time of our universe. And it's the time previous to the Big Bang. When the universe expands from very, very small scales to the scales that we see it now. And that would be the solution to why the universe looks so similar in completely opposite directions. So the new thing is polarization. And Planck will do it, but even more. Uh, so, sorry, uh, I'm going to show you uh, uh, a figure with the polarization pattern. So this is with the signal from inflation. And then this is without the signal from inflation. Can you see the difference? So it's a very, very dim signal, what we are trying to measure. And for that, you need a specialized instrument and I'm going to introduce you to SPIDER, our balloon borne telescope that we're planning to fly from Antarctica in uh, the next December. 
So that's uh, how SPIDER looks. SPIDER has six telescopes and it's going to fly uh, from Antarctica and only scan a small patch of the sky. That should be enough to distinguish the particular signal from, uh, from inflation. And this is how we build it. And now I stop torturing you guys with physics and uh, let's go to the front part and it's Antarctica, of course. So how do we fly this, uh, these telescopes on board of balloons? So the balloon is provided by a division of NASA which is called CSBF. Uh, the balloon is this big in, co in relation to the CN Tower which makes him about the size of the sky dome when it's completely inflated. This balloon can lift up to 8,000 pounds and uh, take it to 42 kilometers up in the atmosphere. And if you saw Felix Baumgartner jumping from the stratosphere, this is exactly the same kind of balloon. So the balloon cruises the cruise uh, altitude of, uh, of commercial flights and it's going up to 40 kilometers over the surface of the, of the Earth where there's only 5% of the atmosphere left. So you don't have to worry about your radiation not coming into the telescope. And we fly them from Antarctica. And why do we do that? First, because there's almost nobody in Antarctica. So if it falls, the chances of hurting anybody are very low. But there's also another reason which is more important. And is when there's a change of season in Antarctica, the wind pattern is such that if you're in the stratosphere, anything that is uh, flying around will be taken back to the origin point. So you have this uh, nice trajectory around the South Pole, which makes us launch the balloon and recover it around 12 or 15 days later. This is really handy because the satellites don't have enough, enough bandwidth to retrieve all of the data. So we really, really want our telescope back. Not because we have spent more than five years building it or because it's such a pricey uh, piece of equipment. It's because we need the data back. And how do you get there? So the part of Antarctica where I was is probably the nicest because there's Deception Island and Exasperation Inlet. No, we're in Mount Terror. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the less bad part of Antarctica. And to get there, you fly from Christchurch in New Zealand. And you fly to an island that is uh, around here, the Ross Island. You fly in a C-17 of the United States. And before that, they have to provide you with clothes. Uh, so this is the extreme cold temperature this, uh, clothing distribution center in Christchurch, New Zealand. And they give you the clothes that you're going to wear for uh, a month, if it's my case, or three months, if you're Laura, or more, if you're the guy who stays behind to recover the balloon. <laughs> uh, the ECW is composed of very beefy boots and oh, some overalls one of these Canada Goose red parkas that we have to wear and it becomes like a second skin and mittens and gloves and these orange bags that we have to carry all the time because that's where we carry uh, our extreme cold temperature. So when you're arriving to Antarctica, the first thing that you see is the plagues of frozen ocean. Uh, this is the Discovery Bay. This is where the first Antarctic explorers arrived. This is very close to where we were. And these are the Transantarctic uh, trans Mountains. And this is our airplane landing there. So if you want to have an impression of how is it landing in Antarctica, I have a small video that I can show you. If it works. So when we arrive, the landing is over the frozen ocean. It's in an airport that is made over the frozen ocean. As the season proceeds, the ocean starts to melt and they have to move the airport towards the continent. And we live in this merry and beautiful town, McMurdo. McMurdo has around a thousand inhabitants most of the time. Around 25% of them are girls most of the time. And we, we, we live in this... Uh, cubicles, uh, very nice, usually we share a room, we're with one or two people, uh, 
but we don't live there all the time. We have to go to the LDB base. LDB stands for Long Duration Balloon, and it's the place where we launch uh, and construct our telescopes. That is uh, around 16 kilometers from the base, and we have to commute there every morning. So if you complain about the TTC, I'm going to show you how is it commuting in Antarctica. It's a really bumpy ride. And then we get to the base. Uh, these are the two tallest buildings in Antarctica. And we work in one of them. <laughs> and we put our telescope together in front of Mount Erebus, which is the southernmost active volcano. And this is our beautiful telescope that we flew uh, in 2012 and 2010. It's called Blaspo. And it doesn't care about the CMB. It actually cares more about what is between us and the CMB. But this is the same thing that we're going to do with a spider. We're going to fly it from the same point, and this is me. Uh, this thing that uh, looks like uh, aluminum foil is uh, aluminized mylar, and it's what avoids the telescope to roast when it's exposed to the sun all the time. And this is our beautiful telescope, uh, Blaspo. So we proudly made it during uh, three weeks on uh, BFTBA. Uh, can anybody tell me what that stands for? Exacto. <laughs> and this is how Blaspo looks. So this uh, balloon-borne telescope, there are automated platforms. That means that they're supposed to work without having anybody uh, in charge of them, which rarely happens, but they're designed to do that. And they're attached to the balloon up here. There's a motorized swivel that is in charge of moving it left and right, and it's helped by a big reaction wheel that is down here. It's basically a wheel that spins on one direction, and then you move towards the other direction, and so, so forth. Uh, there's an elevation drive which allows us to look up and down. Uh, there's a flight computer, and in, inside of this box there are two hard drives that we have to retrieve at the end of the mission. And we have the detectors and the camera, which are in this uh, blue vessel in there, and they're cooled down to minus 270 degrees Celsius. And we work there. This is the panorama of uh, of a day in McMurdo. This is inside of our offices. We go outside a lot. We have lots of meetings. And we are happy and we build this amazing instrument. And we celebrate too. So I, I had lots of questions about what we eat. So actually this time when I was down there, I, I, I was in charge of taking pictures of, uh, of our food. So this is our Thanksgiving meal. And we get all kinds of treats that have been frozen before. So we get Alaska king crab, and we have turkey, and frozen vegetables. And if you're really, really lucky, there's an airplane that comes with fresh veggies, which is a high commodity in Antarctica. This is Blaspo when we're testing it. And this is the deployment vehicle. Uh, it's called the bus, and it's a modified fire truck, which is designed to drive backwards. So when they're driving, the, the driver is looking in the direction of the telescope. And you'll see why is that. When uh, we're about to launch, the balloon is inflated. And then uh, the deployment vehicle has to make a line with the flight train of the balloon. So this is the balloon when it's uh, inflated. This is a uh, 1 million uh, liters balloon that is full of helium. And it's what takes us up there. And then once the balloon is released, the task of this vehicle is chasing the balloon, such that the, the flight train doesn't oscillate and we end up crashing against the Earth. So we have to wait until this is completely aligned. And once it's completely aligned, comes a very delicate point in which everything can go wrong, and it's releasing the balloon. So if you want to do the experiment at home, buy yourself a balloon, put it like this, and then run after it until it's completely vertical, and then you let it go. So if you didn't convey the emotion that that entitles, I have a little movie for you. <laughs> and with that, I'm pretty much done. Thanks very much.
And that's how we plan to measure the Big Bang. Thanks very much. when it lands. <laughs> Any questions? Oh, sure. What question are you using with balloons in Antarctica? Has anyone thought, like, is it any, there's like a technical reason for doing that people's like high altitude airships instead for places where the winds are not circular? Uh, well, it's very hard because you don't have air to sustain you. So unless you have propulsion that keeps you up there, and then once you're up there with propulsion, why don't send a satellite? It's, it's actually right, cheaper. So the balloon allows you to stay up there without needing uh, propulsion. And how, like, has, is it also possible to, like, how does it compare, say, if you're putting a similar telescope on an aircraft? Oh, that's a good question. So there's some guys that do the same, and that's called SOFIA. SOFIA. So SOFIA is a telescope that is on board of an airplane. But airplanes fly only at nine kilometers, so actually in the infrared, you still have some of the atmosphere that doesn't let you see up into the space. We can talk later about that, if you're interested. Please. What is the length again between the, the payload and the top of the balloon? 100 meters, more or less. It's like the length of a soccer field. Uh, <laughs> so why, why somebody would jump from the balloon, yeah. like Baumgartner? So back in the 50s, it was because people didn't know how was it living in the space. So the closest that you can get to the space is a balloon. So they wanted to fly people up there, and they flew uh, an army man uh, called Joe Kittinger. So he was up there, and he tested all the... Uh, strength that you need to have in order to survive a launch and be in an environment where there's no air to breathe. And we did it this time because it's cool, it's awesome, <laughs> but it took us 50 years to fly somebody else again. So it was really hard. So, but is it good to fly someone up in a balloon and jump off? Oh, we, we, have, we have this cost about sending somebody to fix our telescope up there, but it's very dangerous. So, <laughs> I, I don't think it's possible. Ah, okay. So the difference between isotropic and homogeneous. Actually, I have a nice drawing to make for that. So imagine you have a little box and it's full of dots. Okay? And then you have a box that has stripes. Both are homogeneous because both are the same in different scales. So you have here lines all around and here you have dots all around. So that's homogeneous. Isotropic means that if you're walking, let's imagine you're an ant and you're walking around here, then you find one, then you find another, and it doesn't matter where you're walking, you'll find that there's dots all around. But if you live in this world of stripes and you walk around here, then you'll say, Oh, this is not a world of stripes. This is a world of nothing because you can't see anything in that direction. But if you have another ant that is walking in a separate direction, it will say, no, we're living in the world of stripes because I can see stripes more or less. So this one is non-isotropic. And this one is isotropic. But both are homogeneous. So if you see somebody wearing a striped dress, it's an anisotropic dress. <laughs> Uh, oh, so that's, that's another one. So you can be isotropic without being homogeneous. That's a harder one to, to draw. Yeah, I think you need to be homogeneous in order to be isotropic. Yeah, but out of the top of my head, I, I can't think of any dress pattern that is uh, <laughs> non-homogeneous and isotropic. Complementary, supplementary is a different, different order of information that you're looking for. 
And the second question is, how do you get the green back down? Okay, so the first question is, uh, what we're getting with a spider that we don't get with Planck. So Planck took around 15 years to be built. And they got their detectors around 10 years ago. So they have the state-of-the-art technology 10 years ago. And they have 74 detectors. We have thousands of detectors. So we can map the sky very close to each other. So when Planck is scanning, it can leave gaps uh, between the observations. What are, we're going to do is scan the sky very, very tightly such that we get less noise and we can go deeper than Planck. We're only going to a small patch of the sky and we're going to a, a very precise uh, area. And also we're cheaper than Planck. So in Planck you have professors and postdocs and people that have worked their whole life building Planck and we're graduate students. Like we're training to do this kind of thing. So it's, uh, you can take down the balloon and rebuild your instrument and fix what was wrong and do it again. As Planck is a one trick pony, it's done. So it's very valuable, but we're complementary in that sense. And what, how do we take the balloon down? So the balloon is made of uh, plastic, which is called a stratoplastic, which is just polyethylene. It's very similar to the plastic that you use to make sandwich wraps. Uh, so at the end of the flight, there's, uh, there's something like a zipper on top. So they release the zipper. So the payload wants to come down, and it pulls on the balloon, and it opens like a Pac-Man. And then that becomes rubbish. Like after it's going down, it becomes a rock of plastic that falls somewhere in Antarctica. I know, but it's so expensive to find something in Antarctica, and the balloon is transparent, almost white. So. <laughs> that would be easy to retrieve. You had a question. Uh, two more questions. Yeah, so, what were the uh, discrepancies in the cosmic microwave background that you said that you were trying to measure? Okay, so Planck was trying to go deeper than this. This is the the universe seen by WMAP. So WMAP found uh, some particularities in the universe. One of them is this spot. It's a cold spot which was very weird. But Planck was already planned before that. Planck is just the evolution of seeing this closer. But one of the particular targets was that cold spot, which was uh, damaging this uh, idea that we have of uh, homogeneity and isotropy. So that was one of the things that uh, they were trying to see. But Planck, in principle, was going to do it better, better resolution, and we were going to get rid of the galaxy in a better way. So is the end goal like completely is it like, like what are all the, the dots and such, is that like matter? Uh, so that's a very good question. All the dots, the difference between a red dot and a blue dot is one part in 100,000. So it's a very small variation. And actually those small variations are related to where galaxies are now and where galaxy clusters and where the structure of the universe. So we think that those inhomogeneities are causing the large scale structure of the universe to look like it looks now. Okay, one more question. Uh, so, the microwave radi radiation um, originated uh, sometime after the Big Bang, but at that time it was caused by uh, nuclear fusion, so it was very hot. Yeah. So there's, there's two ways of seeing that. One way is the universe was in a very compact state, and it was very hot, and it is expanding. It cools down. So the wavelength uh, changes. The other way to see it is that the wavelength has been redshifted. So when you uh, see the universe at the temperature that was at the Big Bang, it was almost X-rays. But since it's been going away from us, that wavelength has been expanded. But it's, it's two ways of seeing the same process, and it's just by expanding, it cools down.
the wavelength can change according to the moment. Yeah, so imagine the lamp is just going away from you. Yeah. So it's redshifted. That's the same that happens in the universe. It would eventually shift to radio? Uh, to microwave. From microwave will eventually shift to radio? Yeah, yeah, in a, in a far future. As it cools down. Any other question? Oh, wait, I have something else to show you. But yeah, I knew I was going to break this. <laughs> yeah. So back to the question we were talking about the wavelength. So the universe is flat. So the wavelengths mm -hmm. we observe is actually longer than the wavelengths we radiate. So in physics, uh, if the wavelength is shorter, the energy becomes larger. So where does it lose energy to become longer wavelengths? No, it's the energy density changes because the universe is expanding. So before you had lots of energy concentrated in a small volume, but as it expanded, that energy is distributed over the whole volume. Okay. So if you like this talk and you like all of these uh, Antarctica adventures, you have to see Keith Vanderlyn. So Keith Vanderlyn is a new faculty here at the University of Toronto, and he's even more hardcore. He didn't even go just to launch a balloon and recover it later. He lived in Antarctica, in the South Pole, and he was working at the South Pole Telescope. And he was working on the anisotropies, on the little dots that we observe in the CMB. He was working on that. So if you're really interested in this kind of topics and in Antarctic adventures, you should come on April the 20th at 6.30. And Keith is going to be giving a talk. Uh, also, there is this thing uh, that is going on in April 18th. I don't know too much about it, but you can read it online. <laughs> <laughs> and now, uh, if you're going to the planetarium or you're going to the telescopes, you should follow these guys. So, thanks very much again. <laughs> <laughs>